Labor Day 2018. I know a lot of you uh, will be able to have a little time away this weekend. Maybe it was yesterday. For some of you, maybe you're getting away this afternoon. For some of you, you know, maybe you're just grilling out tomorrow afternoon. And for some of you, you don't get a day off, right? I mean, you just work, 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 and it seems like you never get a day off. But someday you will. Someday you will. What I wanted to do was talk today about work as worship. You know, I preached a message about this probably about six months ago. I want to say it was back in February um, of this year. And, and I kind of want to hit it again. And where I want to start is where that video started, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. I don't often preach from Genesis, but here's what I want you to know about Genesis as you're turning there. And by the way, um, most of the, actually, none of the scriptures will be on screen today. I decided to keep this very simple. But if you have a worship guide, uh, everything from Genesis, without a doubt, is in the worship guide. If you need one of those, there's some by the back door. There's some over here. Um, and also, as you're turning to Genesis um, chapter 1 and 2 and 3, we're going to hit some verses in all three of those chapters. Uh, let me say this, uh, because somebody asked me, uh, I think it was last week, came up to me with offering and said, Pastor Chris, what do I do with my offering? We didn't take up offering today, and it had been a few weeks since she'd been here, and, and she didn't realize that things had kind of changed. And if you're new, you may be wondering, like, that. Don't churches normally take up an offering? And, and he hasn't even said anything about money. Most churches ask for money. Uh, we do have giving boxes. There's a black one right there, and there's one on the back wall. In your worship guide, there's instructions for how you can give in those boxes. You can give online. You can actually give by text with your phone. Here's what I want all of you to know. Please don't stop giving if you are a, a member of the church because you, if you're a member, you're an owner here, right? I mean, there, there are no, this isn't a country club. It is not a country club, and there are no super rich benefactors who are paying for everything. As a church, as a family, we all contribute to what goes on around here, right? If you are one of our guests, we do not expect you to. But here's what I will say. When you learn to, to, to manage your finances God's way, God blesses you, without a doubt. When you learn to manage your finances God's way, God blesses you, and part of that is just simply giving, all right? So I'm not asking for money. I'm not saying that, you know, like we're broke and we need more money. I just want all of you to know, because I haven't said anything about it in weeks. Like it's been weeks since we put the, the things on the wall, and I talked about them for like a month, and, and then I, I just stopped talking about them on purpose, and then we really just kind of stopped talking about offering altogether, and it reminded me last week, like I probably should say something about that, because I just, I haven't in a while. So without a doubt, I thank you for those of you who give faithfully. If you're one of our guests, we don't expect you to give today, but at some point, if you're a part of our church, we'd love for you just to begin to manage your finances God's way, and we can help you learn how to do that as well. So the book of Genesis, book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created. Genesis is important, and here's what I'll say to you about Genesis. If you have never read at least the first six chapters of Genesis, not even the rest of the book, but the first six chapters. The first six chapters of Genesis set the foundation for our theology of who God is, what, who man is, what sin is, and God's work in this world, right? And the way that God works in the world and works around the world and works in spite of man in the world. Like, read Genesis 1 through 6. If you don't have a really good understanding of Genesis 1 through 6, honestly, you cannot have a great understanding of all the rest of Scripture because it is based on what happened in the beginning, and that is the book of Genesis. I'm not saying that you can't trust Jesus as your Savior if you've never read Genesis or you're not a Christian. If you've never, That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying to have a full understanding of the theology of God, we need to dig into Genesis. And so what I want to do in just a very small way this morning is just dig in. I want to drill deep in just, in just one one idea, it comes from two or three different places in Genesis at the very beginning in the first three chapters, but one idea that, that is important to us, and the reason that it's important to us, especially adults, but kids, you're going to be there someday too, is that we all work, right? We all work. Now, some of you may say, well, I'm a stay-at-home mom, and some of us may say, well, that means that you don't work. I do not say that because my beautiful wife works at home and works her tail off. And for those who, who are still, like, you still work. A lot of people look at pastors and like, well, you only work on Sundays and Wednesdays. Yep, you're right. 
that's, that's exactly when I work is on Sundays and Wednesdays and every other day in between, right? I mean, listen, we all, we all, we all, we all work in one fashion or another. Some, you know, put in lots of hours on a job site and you get paid for the work that you do. Some of you, you put in lots of hours at home and you, you get paid in like hugs and kisses and dirty laundry, like we're going to be talking about next week, right? I mean, like, like, but we all, we all work. At some level, we all work. As a matter of fact, we probably put more time into work in our lives than we do anything else except sleep. And we just want to go sleep when we get finished working, right? I mean, that's just what we want to do. So what I want to talk about this weekend, this Labor Day weekend, is this idea of work is worship. Can our work, should our work, is our work actually worship? What does God's word have to say about that, and that may be a, a topic that you've never even thought about before. Like, normally when I, when I say the word worship, or when somebody thinks about worship, you think on Sundays or maybe Wednesdays, but it's something that happens at church, right? That, that worship happens at church. We, we go to church to learn about God and to worship, and a lot of times when we say worship, you think about music, like, you know, somebody being able to sing beautifully, play an instrument. It's about you know, leading us to raise our hands. Maybe it's prayer, maybe it's singing, maybe it's clapping, but all of that is worship. And so I'll worship on Sundays, and I might even worship Monday through Saturday in my car with the radio on, like, you know, listening to a Christian radio station or listening to a a Christian CD. Maybe I'll worship God then, or maybe, maybe Monday through Saturday, I'll, you know, like, walk by my kids' rooms and I'll hear them worshiping because they're listening to music. Or maybe I'll even pray with my kids or pray with my wife, and we might consider that worship. But it's very rare that most people ever step back and go, huh, this thing that I do 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 hours a week, could that be worship? I want to consider that this morning, and I want to say at the very beginning that, that yes, it absolutely can be worship, and it absolutely should be worship, and it was created to be worship. You may have never thought about that before, but we're going to get into that. So here's what I want to do. I want to read a few verses in Genesis. I'm going to read it right out of the worship, guys. If you got that, hopefully you'll read right along with me. And then for homework, read Genesis at least 1 through 3, but Genesis 1 through 6 is awesome. Genesis 1, 27 and 28 says this, so God created human beings in his own image. This is the creation story. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. All right, so at the very beginning, God creates man and woman. He says, okay, you've got a job to do. Go make babies, all right, and fill up the earth. Guys, that's God's first command. Go make babies. Congratulations, husbands. All right, go make babies. That's God's first command. Genesis chapter two, verse 15, it says this. Then the Lord God took the man, that would be Adam. He took the man and he put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. God gave Adam a job. Here's the garden, go take care of it, okay? So that's the first time that we really see this command to work. Because going and making babies is not work, okay? So I'm going to give you this command. I'm going to put you in the garden and go work. That's in Genesis 2.15. Then what happens is that Adam, working in the garden, Eve is there with him. God has told them, uh, you, can, you can eat any fruit of any tree, of any bush. Like anything growing from the ground is yours to eat, except the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that, you will surely die. Like, like God's command is don't eat that fruit the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, you will surely die. And so what happens? The serpent shows up, tempts Eve. Eve takes the fruit. She gives it to Adam. They eat the fruit. Sin enters the world, and Adam spiritually died immediately because he was separated from God, and so did Eve. And eventually, they died physically. Sin entered the world. The world was broken, and that's why we're suffering today. And then we get to Genesis chapter 3, right after all of that happens. God shows back up, and in verse 17 it says this, And to the man, he said, that's God, and to the man, God said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. 
All your life will struggle. You will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Though you will eat of its grains by the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. All right, the first idea I want you to see from these passages, because this is, this is the description of creation of man, what man was designed to do, then man broke that, and then God gave man an additional command or, or a, another command, kind of tweaked what man was supposed to do, and that's what we've been doing ever since, ever since. And so we need to understand what's going on here. So the first thing I want you to see is that you were created to be creative. You were created to be creative. We serve a creative God. In Genesis chapter one, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that he spoke out of nothing. He spoke into existence something. He spoke into existence the, the heavens and the earth and the waters and the plants and the, uh, the plants and the animals and everything that lives on the earth and above the earth and, and in the waters, and then he created humans. God is a creative God, and you were made in his image. You were made in the image of God. In Genesis chapter one, what we just read, it says that God said, let's, let's make man in our image. And so that's what he did. God created men and women, all of us, with his thumbprint on us to be creative like God is creative. He created us to be creative. Now, some of you are thinking, I'm not very creative. Like, I tried to paint in the third grade, and they took all of my paints away, right? Like, like my teacher, you know, in the, in the fourth grade, you know, told me I had to start coloring in between the lines because by fourth grade, I'm like, I'm no artist, and I still couldn't figure out how to color in between, like Pastor Chris, I am, I, I am not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not creative. I'm not creative. Like, that's what you would say. I'm not, I'm telling you, you were created to be creative. Look at Genesis 2.15 in your notes, just real quick. Look at Genesis 2.15, what it said. It says, the Lord took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it, to cultivate it and keep it. Depending on what translation you may be reading on your app or in your paper Bible, where it says to cultivate it, it may say to work it, to keep it. One translation says to dress it. This, this word, I, I've really tried to study this week, and I don't wanna mess all this up in Hebrew because I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so my, like, I don't know it at all. But I've tried to kind of dig into, the, into, those, into that phrase and into the word in particular to, to cultivate, and it's the word abad or avad, or we see different, different um, uh, uses of the word, like avodah, right? What that word is implying, and I really like the translation cultivate, that's why I put it in your notes, is that when God looked at Adam, he said, okay, here's the deal. I already did the hard work. I spoke, it came into existence. You've got all the plants and animals. I've created this beautiful garden. I've put you in the middle of it. I've done the hard work. And so now what I want you to do is make something new. I've given you all the raw materials that you need, Adam. And I want you to avodah. I want you to work. I want you to, sometimes this word is translated serve. This word is also sometimes translated worship. I want you to use your hands and I want you to take all the raw materials that I've put into this world and I want you to do something new with it. I want you to begin to work with it, to cultivate it. What do you do when you cultivate a garden, right? When you, when, you, when you cultivate something, like if you're working in a garden, you start digging in the dirt, right? You plant some seeds, something grows up, you prune it, you water it, you make sure that it's got all the sunlight that it needs, it begins to sprout fruit, you pick the fruit, right? And then sometimes what do like really crazy, awesome gardeners do? They take a little cutting from this plant, they put it in a cutting from another plant, and they create a new plant. And they begin to, to cross breed different species or whatever it is, different varieties, not species, but varieties of those plants. In the beginning, there were not all of the varieties of animals and all of the varieties of fruits and vegetables that there are today. Adam 
cultivated that. I want you to think about Genesis chapter one, if you've read it, go back and read it again. When God created the heavens and the earth, at the end of every day, when he created something, he looked at what he created and he said, behold, this is what? Good. I knew some of you would know that. He said, this is good. Did God say this was perfect? No. He said, this is good. Did God say this cannot be improved upon? No. God said it was good. You know When God told Adam, I'm going to put you in the garden, I want you to cultivate it. You know what he was saying to Adam? I've given you some raw materials. Now you make it perfect. Now just pause for a second and let that sink in. I thought that my pastor in Sunday school has always taught me that when God created the heavens and the earth, creation in the beginning, that it was perfect. Here's what we've done. We've confused two words that don't mean the same thing. When God created the heavens and the earth, it was sinless. It was without fault, but it was not perfect. Because here's what the word perfect means. The word perfect means something is at such a state that it can neither be added to nor taken away from and made any better. If something is perfect, you can either add to it nor take away from it and make it any better. What was the very first thing that God told Adam to do? Go make babies. Does that sound like something new? Yes. Does that sound like we're adding to the world? Absolutely. You know what that means? The world was not perfect. I just blew some of your minds. When God created the heavens and the earth, the world was not perfect. It was sinless, but it was not perfect. As a matter of fact, before God told Adam to go and multiply, he looked at Adam. Because remember, he looked at the world. He created all this stuff. He said, it's all very good. As a matter of fact, when he created man, he said, it's very good. Then he looked at Adam, and he brought him all these animals and, and all the plants around him. And Adam's starting to you know, name the tiger and the lion and the bear. Oh, my. And he's, he's doing all this stuff. And God sees Adam, and Adam is... I don't know, there's like this this new word that Adam's trying to figure out. I think the word was lonely, that he was alone. There wasn't an Eve. When God created the world, it was not perfect yet. Then he took, he put Adam to sleep. He took the rib out of Adam, meaning from the ground, and he created from Adam woman, Eve, because she came from the rib of man. God created woman and put man and woman together. Why? Because when God created the world, it was not perfect. He added something to it. And he's told us to cultivate the world and keep adding things to it. Now listen, nothing's ever been created that God did not create. Scripture is very clear about that. There is nothing that we are creating ourselves. We are creative, but we are not creators. And so what God did was he gave us all the raw materials that we needed and said, okay, go have fun. Have you ever thought for just a second, like why Legos are so popular? Why Minecraft is so popular? Why every baby you've ever known that's ever been born in the United States of America, at some point in their lives, they get blocks, all right, like somebody gives them, I don't care if they're wooden blocks, plastic blocks, it, they get blocks. And you know what they do with them? Like you don't have to teach them what to do. You know what they do with the block? They put one block down, and they might kick it around and roll around, but eventually they take another block, and they put it on top. Oh, I just created like the little baby brain goes crazy. They just created something new. And then they go to preschool, and they don't just have those little cube blocks. Like they've got cylinder blocks and blocks that look like bridges and triangle blocks. And they go to preschool. I remember doing this in preschool. And before you know it, like they've created a castle. And like, you know, not everybody loves to build, and they build, you know, giant skyscrapers out of Legos. That's not what happens. But everybody inside of you, you have something that God planted in you that says, go be creative. And that's what Adam and Eve did. Not to make the world sinless. That's not what I'm talking about. But the reason that Adam and Eve, the reason that God said, go work, go cultivate, go go tend to everything, was so that they would make the world more 
and more perfect. Perfect. Let me give you one more example of perfection. My beautiful wife is sitting on the front row. All you ladies should go, oh, right? Beautiful wife is sitting on the front row. When she walks into church, I guarantee you every single Sunday, you will never see her that her hair is out of place. You will never see her that her makeup is not perfect, that her clothes are not just right. When she walks into church for Sunday morning, she is perfect. You can neither add to nor take anything away to make it any better. When she gets up in the morning, she's good. (laughs) Better than most, I would even say. But when she comes into church, she's perfect. Like, listen, that's what God wants us to do. He, God in our work for, for men and women, it's like we're looking in the mirror and we're going, okay, that's out of place, I need to fix that. Okay, I'm gonna go to work and see that something's out of place, I need to move that. I'm gonna walk into my kids' rooms and see that there's a mess, I need to clean that up. Listen, all of that, every bit of that is about us being who God created us to be, which is to be creative. So number one, you were created to be creative. Number two is this, work is not a curse. It is our divine purpose. Work is not a curse. It is our divine purpose. Now, trust me, we have all wanted to curse work, right? We've all wanted to cuss our boss out at one time or another, right? I mean, it it happens. We all, like at some point, we hate whatever our job is or what it used to be, right? And, and, and maybe you're like, you're in between jobs because you quit the last job because it was so horrible that you couldn't stand, you couldn't dream of going back there. And so you would rather risk not being able to pay all your bills before you find a new job because the last job was so bad. And without a doubt, you would probably say that that job was a curse. But in God's creation, in God's economy, work is not a curse. Work was actually and still actually is a gift. It is, it is your divine purpose in life. It's what God gave Adam to do. Go into the garden, work it, cultivate it. Notice, look again back at Genesis 2.15, if, if, if you've got your worship guide or in your Bible. Back at Genesis 2.15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden, and then he says to cultivate it and to keep it. Where was Adam before God put him in the garden? Have you ever thought that before? Like I just thought God created the world and created the Garden of Eden and then created Adam in the garden. Go back and read it. That's not what happened. Like I have thought that that my, I'm 40 years old and I'm like a five or six days old knowing this. God did not create Adam in the garden. God created Adam, it says, outside of the garden, out of the dust of the ground that was not in the garden. He created Adam out of the dust of the ground that was not in the garden. He created Adam out of the dust, and then he took Adam, and he put him in the garden for a purpose. The purpose was to work. He took Adam from outside of the garden and put him in the garden to work. Okay, hang with me here, because I'm about to like run off the rails and get real deep. Just hang with me. You'll get it. The other way that this word work, especially the the, the cultivate and to keep, or the work and to keep, where we see those words show up, that phrase, very similar phrasing over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament, and a little bit in the New Testament, but it's in Hebrew in the Old Testament, is every time someone is writing about what the priest did in the temple. That when the priest went into the temple, their job was to work it and keep it was to serve and to guard. It's the same words used in Genesis to describe what Adam is supposed to do. Adam was the first priest. God created Adam out of the dust of the ground that was good, but listen to me, it was not holy. Okay, stay with me here. When Adam was created out of the dust of the ground, it was good dirt, right? Some of you come from good dirt. You know, you're good Salt of the earth, good dirt kind of people, right? God created Adam out of good dirt, but not holy dirt. It was not holy ground. It was outside of the garden. It was earth. He created Adam out of the earth. 
And then what made Adam holy, if you go back and you read Genesis chapter 2 again, what made Adam holy was when God breathed the ruach, the breath of life, the very breath from the nostrils of God entered into Adam, and that's what gave him life. It was not the ground, because the ground was not holy. It was God's presence in Adam's life that gave him, or in Adam's body that gave him life. And then God created Adam in his image, breathed his breath into him, gave him life, made Adam holy, and then do you know what he did? He put Adam on holy ground. The Garden of Eden was holy ground. And the reason that I know it was holy ground is because the Garden of Eden was described as the dwelling place of God. And wherever is the dwelling place of God, that's holy ground. The temple, when the priests would go in and they would serve God, they would work it and they would keep it, they would be standing on holy ground. As a matter of fact, only one priest one time a year could go into the holy of holies. He had to be completely sinless. He had to you know, confess all of his sins. They would put him in a special robe that had bells around the bottom and, 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 a, and a rope tied around his ankle because if he wasn't sinless and he walked into the presence of God, he would drop dead and they'd have to, you know, when the bell stopped ringing, they would drag his dead body back out. Like it was a serious, serious thing. When Moses sees the burning bush, And he gets close to the bush because he can't figure out, like, this bush is burning, but he doesn't know what's going on because it's not burning up. And he walks up close to it. He hears the voice of God, and God says, Moses, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. What makes it holy ground is it's where God is dwelling. It is the dwelling place of God. And so God creates Adam out of dust, blows him off, blows in his mouth, makes him holy, and then sets him on holy ground, and Adam gets to live there. Now, just imagine for a second, anything you've ever thought about heaven, any idea you've ever thought about what heaven would be like, should be like, maybe the Bible says is like, okay? Eden was not heaven, but without a doubt, it was heaven on earth because it was God's dwelling place. And you know what Adam got to do? He got to walk around with God because right after Adam and Eve sinned, we, we read In Genesis chapter 3, we didn't read this verse this morning, but again, go back and read it, that it says, in the cool of the evening, as God was walking through the garden, like this was something regularly that God did. In the cool of the evening, as God was walking through the garden, he didn't see man and woman, he didn't see Adam and Eve, and so he asked, where are you guys? They were hiding because they were hiding, they were ashamed of their sin and their nakedness. Adam was the first priest, and the gift that God gave him was he got to work on holy ground. He got to exist in an environment that was heaven on earth. And when God said to Adam and Eve, when he said to Adam, cultivate it, work it, keep it, guard it, and he said to Adam and Eve, go forth and multiply, you know what part of that multiplication was? Part of that multiplication was looking at the prototype of the Garden of Eden and creating that in the town next door, creating that on the other side of the lake, creating that all around the world so that as Adam took the holiness and the presence of God with him and and, and gave that same holiness and presence of God to his children, and his children worked to build their houses and cultivate their gardens, they would also be dwelling in the presence of God because that was God's plan. God's original plan was for this earth to basically be a giant garden of Eden. I know that sounds weird, but as I read and study Genesis, that's the conclusion that I keep coming back to is that when God said go forth and multiply, yes, he was talking about having kids, but God's always wanted to have a relationship with us. God has always wanted to walk with us, talk with us. I mean, that's what I've been taught my entire life in church is how important it is for me to trust Jesus because God wants to have this relationship with me. And if God wants to have this relationship with me and holy ground, the Garden of Eden, is his dwelling place and I'm supposed to be Adam and go and perfect the rest of the world, what's my job as Adam? Create some more Gardens of Eden. Go and improve on what God said was good to make it even better, 
to be creative as I was created to, to be creative and then invite God to come dwell there and plant some people. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen because sin entered the, the world. But see, work was not a curse. It was a gift. God was saying, I'm going to have this relationship with you. And the way that we're going to have this relationship is you're going to go and work, and you're going to create more holy ground. And as you have kids, I'm going to come dwell in that place, and we're going to make that holy. And they're going to be holy because they're going to have my breath in their lungs just like you have my breath in your lungs. And we'll be a holy people on holy ground. But it didn't happen. Man sinned. And God kicked them out of the garden. And I want you to notice um, in verse... This is in Genesis chapter 3, uh, toward the end of what we read. I believe this is verse 23. It says that God sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. God sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. He was cultivating holy ground in the beginning. And now he's been sent out of where it is holy to where it is not the temple of God, it is not holy. And his job is to cultivate holy ground, or unholy ground, that now is not only unholy, it's the ground that he came from, it's not, it's not only unholy ground, it's cursed. Because God said, oh, right, okay, Adam, like, I created, you, I created you to love you, to have a relationship with you. Part of the reason I created you was to work, to go forth, to multiply, to, to take holy ground with you, to to, to, to do all of this stuff. And now, Adam, you've got to go tend the ground that you came from, and because of your sin, this ground is now cursed. The work that we do is not the curse, but the ground is cursed. And God says that weeds and thorns and thistles are going to grow up, and by the sweat of your brow, you will get to eat the fruit of your labors, but it's going to be by the sweat of your brow. So the third, the third point that I want to make is this. Your sweat your sweat, your struggle, your hard work, your sweat represents the curse of sin being squeezed out of your body. And it's not just sweat. I just picked out that one word. It's the struggle. Listen, when you go to work, and work just sucks, that is sin. I'm not saying that you are sinning, right? That's not what I'm saying. But when work is just horrible, that is sin. That is you rubbing up against a broken, sinful, godless world. Because in the beginning on holy ground in the Garden of Eden, Adam didn't struggle. Did he work? Yes, it was a gift of God. I get to, I get to be in the presence of God and serve him and love him and work and, and worship him. That's part of my work. But now I'm out here and I'm on unholy ground. I'm not in the temple anymore. I'm outside of the garden. And it's cursed because of sin. And now you... Get to rub up against it. Woohoo! Doesn't that sound like fun? Doesn't that make you just want to curl up and not go to work tomorrow? Thank God we get Labor Day and some of us get Mondays off. I feel so sorry for the rest of you. All right? I mean, my kids, my wife, we, we homeschool our kids right now. And, um, you know, she's decided that they're going to take Monday off because they need a break. That just means they got to double up their work for the rest of the week, right? Because they still are going to get their five days worth of lessons in. Is that how y'all's holidays work? Like, right, when you do get a day off, that just means you double up the other days, like either leading up to or on the back end? That's how it's always worked for me. That day off, you never stop working. It just means, like, you work harder on the back end or harder on the front end. I mean, that, that's the way it is for most, for most people. Work just stinks. Listen, the reason that work is so hard, the reason that work is miserable, the reason that you want to quit your job and wish that you had any other job but your job is because of sin. Sin, is, sin has entered the world. It's not the work, it's the sin that we're rubbing up against, that we're struggling against. And it's because of what Adam did and Eve did in the garden to bring this curse onto the world. But here's what I want you to understand about your sin, about my sin. Listen, we're a place where no perfect people are allowed. The Bible has said that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that no one is sinless, and whoever claims to not be a sinner, that that person is a liar, which is actually a sin. So we're all sinners, okay? We're all sinners. But your sin did not change your divine destiny. Your sin did not change 
the purpose that God created you for, and one of those purposes is to work. Your sin did not change that. God still created you to work. God still created you to be creative, and your work can still be worship. See, when Adam was serving God on holy ground in the Garden of Eden, just like the priests were serving God in the temple, what were they doing? They were worshiping. They were worshiping God with their work because they were obeying God. They were doing what God wanted them to do. They were doing what God created them to do. So how do we get back there? Like, how do we, how do we get back to the holy ground? How do we get back to the garden? How do we get into the holy of holies in the temple? Well, you become a preacher like me. Everybody gets to be a pastor and a missionary. Doesn't that sound like fun? I know some of you, you think that. You're like, well, I mean, Pastor Chris, he's just, he's like the most holy guy I know because if he wasn't, they wouldn't let him stand on that stage. Listen, I am as screwed up as the rest of y'all. All All right? I just hide it better most of the time. No, I'm just kidding. But, well, I am. I'm sort of kidding, not kidding. Here's the reality. What has happened in my life has happened in some of your lives and can happen in all of our lives is that I've trusted Jesus as my Savior, and I'm trying to live for him. It just so happens that what God has designed me to do, the work that he gave me to do, was to be a pastor, to be able to communicate, to be able to lead, to be able to to read Scripture and to understand it and to ask questions. He put that desire in me, that passion in me, and I get to live that out. Some of you, he did not create you to do that. He created you to be the best secretary, the best teacher, the best truck driver, the best engineer, the best mechanic, the best artist that you can possibly be. He didn't create you to do my work. He created you to do your work. But sometimes we're tempted to think that unless we're a preacher, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a missionary, we're on the worship team, we're at least, at least playing bass in the band, right? I'm like, at least doing that. Then, then somehow our work can't be worship. Hogwash. Your work, I promise you, your work is your worship. So here's point number four. Chris is a temple owner operator. Except if you're taking notes and you're writing on your blank, put your name in the blank, because my name's Chris. I know some of you are like, dang it, now I've got to scratch out the word Chris, because I already wrote it down. (laughs) Write your name in the blank. Y'all know what an owner operator is, right? For instance, if you're a truck driver and you own your own truck and you drive it, like you own it, if you own it, or it may be you in the bank that owns it, right? But, but you're making the payments on it and it's yours and one day you'll own it free and clear and you operate it, you, you drive it. Um, Chick-fil-A, guys, I, I, like I love Chick-fil-A just as a model, as a business model, as a restaurant. All those guys are, are owner operators. They're owner operators in Chick-fil-A. They own it and they also work in it. All of them work in their business. That's the way the Chick-fil-A model works. They're owner operators. If you have trusted Jesus as your Savior, dadgummit, you are an owner operator of the temple. You are an owner operator of the temple. And I'm not talking about this building. Although sometimes we like to think that, you know, we we should own part of it. Like we need to open doors and welcome people and greet them. And we, and we get out and we cut the grass and we and we maintain this facility because we love coming together in this facility. And we might say that, like, because I'm a member of the church, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm sort of like part owner of the church facility, the building, the real estate. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. You are an owner-operator of the temple because you are the temple. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you are the temple. Listen, here's what it said. Like first, uh, I've made just some, just, you know, go in for homework. Read that 1 Corinthians 6, Colossians 3, and, and Matthew 28, 19, and 20. First, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20 basically says this. Don't you know that your body is not your own? That it is the temple of God, that you have been bought with a great price? So go and serve God. Like, I mean, that's 1 Corinthians is your body is the temple of God. And Colossians teaches us that that was like part of that video that we watched at the very beginning, that that whatever our hand finds to do, whatever work God has given us, 
to work as though we are working for Christ because he's our master, not whoever your boss is, that, that, that Jesus, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And when you work, you're doing temple work for God. You're not doing clerical work for your boss. You're not doing mechanic work for the client. You are working in the temple for God. Jesus is described as the second Adam, okay? Because he wasn't called Adam, he was called Jesus. But he's described as the second Adam because the first Adam was in the first temple, standing on holy ground. He got to be in the temple. And then he sinned and he was kicked out of the temple and humanity was not allowed to go back to that temple ever again anymore. Then Jesus came. Jesus lived a perfect life. He died sinless, but he died for our sins and took our sins upon him to pay the penalty for our sins. And he rose on the third day, but before he died, in his last dying breath, there was an earthquake as he hung on the cross. And in the physical temple that existed then, the curtain between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple was ripped in half to open the presence of God for all of God's people And Jesus is the second Adam because he made it possible for us to stand in the presence of God. And now the presence of God lives inside of you. You see, Adam got to be in the temple, in holy ground. The Israelites, when they were wandering around in the wilderness, they got to carry the temple on their backs. They called it the tabernacle then. And they got to carry it around on their backs and carry the temple and their their holy things with them and set them up and break them down and carry them around. And then the Israelites in Jesus' day when the temple existed, only a couple of people ever got to go inside the temple and only one once a year got to go into the Holy of Holies. But now, the presence of God, that, that holy ground in the garden that was the dwelling, why was it holy? Because it was the dwelling place of God. Why was the tabernacle that they carried on their backs holy because it was the dwelling place of God? Why was the holy of holies that only one guy once a year could go into? Why was it the dwelling why was it holy because it was the dwelling place of God? Guess where God dwells now? In you. In you. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, the Holy Spirit has sealed you for the day of redemption. When Jesus went back into heaven, he said, I'm going to send my spirit. I'm going to send a comforter, a counselor. I'm going to fill you up. And that's what we see. That's what we read about in Acts chapter 2. How the presence of the Holy Spirit made himself known in a way he never had. And thousands came to Christ. Why? Because the disciples were doing temple work. They were going and doing what God called them to do. Some of them kept fishing. Paul kept making tents. But what did he do as he was making tents? And what did the fishermen do as they were fishing? They were fishing for men. They were making tents. And as they made tents to pay for their bills, they were sharing Christ everywhere that they went. Listen, when you work, even if Jesus is not coming out of your mouth because you are the dwelling place of God, your work is holy. Your work is holy. When you're looking at that empty Excel spreadsheet and your boss says, well, you put all of this in and you plug all of those in, what have you done? You have brought order out of chaos. You have brought light to a dark place. You have put numbers in cells without a doubt, but you have done something creative and holy and you perfected that Excel spreadsheet. When your boss comes to you and you're covered in grease, greasy hands, and says, I realize that you're changing the oil, but, but this person's brakes went out. We really need to work on their brakes. Then you start tearing those brakes down. You are not just tearing brakes down. You are not working for the client. You are the holy temple of God and covered in grease and grime under your fingernails. Your wife hates it, right? She hates doing your laundry because your grease gets on everybody else's clothes. Like whatever it is, as you do that and you're breaking the wheel down and the brakes down and you're packing and you're Whatever you do, when you do all that, you put it all back together. What did you do? You saved somebody from dying. You kept their brakes working. You did something new. You did something, I mean, yeah, you've done it a million times, but not to that car and not on that day and not with that client because now you are doing holy work. You're out building houses. You cut a two-by-four. You raise your two-by-four over your head. You know what you just did? You lifted holy hands to God. Listen, When you are working, I don't care what your work is, 
It is holy work. Why? Because you're doing it in the dwelling place of God. You are a walking temple. So when you go to work, whether it's tomorrow or Tuesday, whatever it is, it's going to be hard. Work is not the curse. Work is holy. Work is not the curse. Work is holy. But as you are working as the temple owner operator, and you are doing whatever it is to make money, and it's a struggle, and it's a sweat, you know what you're doing? You're driving out sin. You are experiencing sin in your life, and what you're saying to yourself is, God, I'm not going to let this overtake me. God, be with me. Give me strength. I'm working for you. This is holy. Don't let me quit, God. Don't let Satan win today because I'm going to win. You know who else did that? Jesus in the garden. He had a work that he was created for that he knew he needed to do. The work was on the cross. He knew what was coming. So he began to pray. He began to call out to his father and my father, our heavenly father, God. Say, God, please take this from me. I don't want to do it. It's a struggle. It is sin. I don't, I don't want to deal with this today, but because it's your will, I will. And the Bible says that he was being pressed so much, and the weight of sin was pushing on his soul, and it was so heavy that he sweat drops of blood. It was as if the sin was, was being squeezed right out of him, and he was sinless, but he was taking our sins upon him. Listen, that was the work that Jesus did, and he did not give up because he was doing it for you. The work that you do is not the same as Jesus's, right? You are not, you're not saving people from their sins, but the work that you do is the work of Christ because you are pointing people to a savior who can save them from your sins. Your good work is a good witness. Your bad work is a bad witness. Do good work. That's what the Bible says, to go and do good works because of what God has done for you. Do good work and your good work is a good witness. See your work as something that is holy. And when you see yourself, I promise you, when you see yourself as the temple of God, doing God's work, being dwelled, standing on everywhere you go, you take holy ground with you. Everywhere you go, you are a kingdom bringer. You are advancing the kingdom. You're making holy ground everywhere that you step. When you see yourself that way and you see yourself doing the work of God, the world will see that. And you know what you just did? Work as worship. And that's what God created you to do.